Amen. What a Savior we have. Glad you're here this morning. And the spirit in here seems great this morning. Energy is high. That's good. Sally got a good night's rest this last night. It seems like that. That's good. Or maybe just glad to be back in church with family, worshiping the Lord. You have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter number 6, if you would. Daniel chapter number 6. So thank you for those visiting with us here today. Some are for, here for graduation tonight, our high school graduation from Bridgeport Baptist Academy. And uh, we're looking forward to that tonight. But Daniel chapter 6, as we finish up, Daniel and the lion's den. Boy, I've enjoyed preaching on Daniel and the lion's den. I don't know if you've enjoyed listening to it, but that's not a problem. If you have, go back and listen to it all over again. No, I've enjoyed preaching on it and studying uh, this particular story again. So many powerful truths are found right here. And often, we miss powerful truths in familiar stories. I'm going to say that again so you catch it. We miss powerful truths in familiar stories. We know of Daniel and the lion's den, and we miss some of the truth that God has for us because we know how it ends. We know what happens. We've heard that a hundred thousand different times and different ways, and I don't claim to have any corner on this. It's been preached much better than I could ever preach it. But it's God's Word, and God's Word is always powerful, no matter the delivery. We're going to get Daniel chapter 6 as we finish up. Daniel and the lion's den. Of course, this is now the end of the story. I'm going to give you a sneak preview. The right side prevails. I hope you're not one of those people who flip to the back of the book and figure out what happens or, or goes to the end of the movie. If you have, if you know someone like that who like looks at the end before the movie happens or reads the back of the book, raise your hand if you know somebody like that. Look at that. All right, I like that. There are people all around here who need to be at the altar after, all right, to, to let the story play out. But I'm going to give you the sneak preview. The right side wins in this story. I like a good ending. Don't you? Have you ever read a book or watched a movie where the ending was not quite like, like, it just doesn't end well? What do you think? Wow, I can't wait to read that book again. Everyone dies and the, the girl doesn't get the guy. It's just this horrible ending. I love it. I'll watch it again. Or there's something inside of us like, yeah, at the end of it, this, this worked out just like I was hoping it would work out. That's the ending of Daniel and the lion's den. Everything you could hope for happens in the end of the story. The right guy wins. The pagan king converts. And the bad guys get theirs. That's a little bit of human nature in us. Come on, don't act like I'm some pagan up here. We all have that. We all have it. All you out there have it like me up here. You're like, yeah, because sometimes it seems like the bad guys win. You ever think that? You ever felt that way? Man, how'd they get away with that this time in this story? The bad guys don't win. And they don't win in a bad way. It's a good ending to a good story. But it's not just a good story. It hasn't been the whole time we preached it. It hasn't been. We've seen the characters that God has brought before us with Daniel as the hero of the story. But God, the ultimate hero. We've seen the circumstances. And God is always looking to work through any characters you have in your story and any circumstances you have. You have different characters. You may have the antagonist like Daniel had with the princes and the presidents. It may be in the form of a co-worker. It may be a boss. It may even be in your household, a sibling or extended family. You may have the same characters that Daniel had who are against God and against his ways. But God still can work through any characters that you have in your story. And we saw the circumstances that Daniel was in. Everything was stacked against him. The deck was stacked against Daniel. He didn't stand a chance, humanly speaking, to have a good day. Nothing that he could do. Nothing even that the pagan king, who was the, the most powerful man in the world at that time, nothing he could do. See, the circumstances that Daniel were in are circumstances that sometimes we find ourselves in. Where we feel like the deck is stacked against us. Where no matter which way we look, no matter what we do, we don't see any way for a victory. And yet we see Daniel's, we saw Daniel's faithfulness. As soon as he knew that the decree was signed, as soon as, he was about 80, year old, 80 years old at this time, and I wondered if he hightailed it and ran home. As soon as he knew, he went and did the one thing that he knew he could do, and that is pray to his God. Right, Same thing we began the service with this morning. We pray to our God, God can heal this land. Right. And God was looking to work in his circumstances, and of course he did. So today, the thought for today, I want you to remember, is not that God can work through characters so he can or work through any circumstances. Here's the thought for today. Be prepared for the unexpected when God shows up. 
Be prepared for the unexpected when God shows up. Let's look at the scripture this morning, Daniel chapter 6, beginning in verse number 16, if we could. The Bible says, then the king commanded. We've now hit the low point of the story. We've hit the low point of, the, of what's happened. Now the king has, has looked through all his, he's, he's, uh, he's looked through all the methods and all the ways to release Daniel and nothing can be done. He's run out of all the options. Now we have the low point. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. If this were a TV show, there'd be a commercial break right there. It'd be the longest commercial break known to man. What's going to happen? Daniel's now let down, cast into the den of lions. What happens next? Well, let's keep on looking. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and he passed the night fasting. Neither were there instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Here's a pagan king who believes in a pagan god who's worried sick about a Christian, about a man who follows Jehovah. No doubt in my mind that Daniel is a Christian. Daniel is in heaven now. Only one way to heaven, believing in Jesus Christ. Before the cross, you look to the cross that God would send a Savior. Now we look back to the Savior that God sent. Daniel believed God. Like our theme this year, I believe God. Here's a pagan king so concerned for this man of God. This king had no religion, uh, no real religion at this point. But he can't sleep all night. He's bothered. Verse 19, Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? What do you think the answer is, church? Of course he is. Of course he is. What are lions when compared to God? I'll give you the answer to nothing but a, but a bunch of big kitty cats. What is your problem when compared to God? Nothing but a little thing to God. Where is your lion? What does your lion look like? Just remember that God can make your lion purr. God can make your lion purr. It may be growling at you. It may be roaring at you at the Detroit Zoo a few years back. And there at the Detroit Zoo, I heard across from the zoo, I was in another part of the zoo, a lion roar. I've heard on TV before. It's rather loud on TV, but I tell you what, when I was at the Detroit Zoo and I heard the lion, a chill went up and down my spine. It was an involuntary chill. I was not worried for my life, but that sound was unbelievable. And God makes that big roar a little purr. Is your God able to deliver thee? Yes, he is. And said Daniel, verse 21, to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him because... Help me read this last phrase, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them. And break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble. And to fear before the God of Daniel, for he is a living God, and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall not be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel, 
prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this truth. Lord, I pray you would help us these next few moments. Lord, help us as we listen to your word, that our hearts would be good soil. Lord, help me as I speak to be clear. Lord, to show the truth in a way that would be convicting and correcting as only your spirit can do. But Lord, help me not to muddle it or to make it confusing. Lord, we need you today. I need you. Lord, may we change the way that you touch us. May we be different for your honor, your glory, as we leave this service this morning. And Lord, if there's someone here who has never trusted you as their Savior, whether they're in the auditorium or in the sound of my voice, on live stream or somewhere else, Lord, I'd ask that you would help them to see their need to trust you today and that they would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. What a tremendous ending, right? What a good end of the story. Tremendous characters, tremendous, tremendous truths. And as we, as we finish up this story, Daniel wins. The king worships God. The bad guys lose. You can scroll the credits. The first credit goes to God Almighty. Goes to God Almighty, the creator of the universe. He always gets the glory, or he ought to always get the glory in your life and in my life. When he works in the unexpected and works the supernatural in the unexpected he doesn't just want to work the unexpected and supernatural just for Daniel. He wants to do it for you and for me. Not because we deserve it, but because he's a good God and because he wants to be worshipped. All right, God loves us and God blesses us, but remember, God is concerned with his glory. God wants others to turn to him and to worship him. What does God want for this city in Bridgeport? For, them, for people to worship God. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. What does He want in Saginaw, Michigan? For Saginaw to worship God. In Michigan, for Michiganders to worship God, whether at home or at the store, if we ever get back to the store. What does He want for the United States of America? For a whole country to worship God. What does He want for the global world, seven billion plus people or more now, to worship Him? Why does He work the unexpected? Not just for your benefit or for my benefit. Some would have us believe that that's the only reason God works. Sometimes you'll see those people even on television. Now, we happen to have a TV ministry, but I don't think I'm that prosperity gospel preacher. Send me your handkerchief and I'll pray over it. Better yet, send me your hundred dollars and I'll have it blessed before God. I'm not that guy, but if you send me a hundred, I'm willing to try it. Just saying. I'm just kidding. And sometimes that we, we would have to, to be believed that God is just in it for us, though He loves us very much. We've looked at that on Sunday nights, the love of God through First John. God loves us more than we love Him. God blesses us way more than we deserve it, more than we can give back to Him. God does not work just for us. He works for Him. And in this story, He was working for Himself. And He let Daniel go all the way to the lion's den. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but sometimes you and I don't want to go to the lion's den. We want the solution really early. But God let him go to the lion's den so that God would be magnified, not just so you and I could have a good day. Though at the end of the day, Daniel had a good day. Not so good a night for a couple minutes, but a good day. Look at a couple things that we could as we finish up this story. Because God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we only plan for things we can do ourselves. See, if we're going to Lions Den, we'd pack lion gear. A lion gun, a lion vest. Daniel packed a lion god. Are you ready for God to show up and do the unexpected? I want to see this morning a couple of things. First of all, I want to see and notice the final attitudes in the story. The final attitudes. I see a king who displays fear and hope. This is important, I believe, because he is not a Christian. He does not worship Jehovah, though I believe he converts at the end of the chapter. At this point, he's not converted yet. And he displays fear and hope. So the scripture tells us. He, I see fear for Daniel's life, whom he preferred. This king loved Daniel. He was his favorite counselor, his favorite leader of all the 120 princes and presidents. Daniel was the teacher's pet. So close to the king that the king lost a night of sleep for Daniel. 
It's, it's odd that this pagan would have such concern, but whatever happened, uh, they had their hearts knit together. But this king displays fear and hope. He was desolate. There was no answer in sight. Nothing he could do could change the law. Nothing he could do could bring a good solution. He had fear that Daniel would be destroyed. We see that in verse number 16. Thy God who now serves continually, he will deliver thee. When I read it, I read it as almost a question. He's not stating the fact that God will do it. He's hoping that God will do it. He doesn't know if Daniel's God is big enough for this. He doesn't know if Daniel's God is strong enough. You know why he didn't know that? Because of none of his gods were big enough or strong enough to do that. None of his gods that he worshipped could have done anything about a little measly lion, much less a den of lions. I mean, people around you who don't know God yet except through you. Who don't know God's power except through your testimony and through your life. And this king had fear, but he also had hope. He had hope and he said, your God is, is the living God and Daniel, you serve him continually. It's verse number 16. He said, Daniel, I know you and I know what you say about your God. He's a living God and Daniel, I've watched you serve him continually. Daniel, I just hope that your God is as powerful as he says, he, as you say he is. See, sometimes as Christians who know the living God, we display the same attitude that this king displayed, fear and hope. I hope that your king can do it, or your God can do it, Daniel. I hope that he's able to. We're going to look at him in just a moment, but this is not the same attitude that Daniel had. All right, the king had fear and hope. He's the one that spent all night trying to figure out, oh my goodness, what can I do? He fasted. He didn't eat anything. All right, He didn't have any music come to him. It was a desolate night. It was a disturbed night. And he had this attitude of fear and hope. And I'm afraid that as Christians who worship the true God, the creator of the universe, we have seen him work and we display the same attitude this king displays. Fear and hope. I hope I'm okay. I hope this works out okay. I hope this doesn't happen. This is not the way that Daniel operated inside of this account. Though you would kind of expect that. Daniel would have hope and fear. But that's not what we see. I would say this, that remind us that we ought to have the testimony that Daniel had. The king knew about God because of Daniel. Is there anybody that around you that knows about God because of you? You say, wow, we know of your God, J.D., because of your testimony. We know he's a living God because you say he is. We know that you serve him continually. Is there anyone in your life who, who, who you can point to God? Jesus says it this way, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It's not about me and it ain't about you. It's about him. My life is not about me or my kids and my wife, who I love them dearly. It's not about this church. It's about God Almighty. They may see your good works and glorify who? Your father. They see a pagan king who displays fear and hope. But then I see the servant of God. What's his attitude? It's a little bit of a Calvary-like attitude. It's a little bit like a Rambo-like attitude. It's a little bit unnatural. He's about to get tossed, and he's getting tossed into the lion's den. This is not a good situation. Anyone else would be maybe begging for their life, crying for mercy, looking for a solution, holding on to the rock as they cast him down there to not, but no, not Daniel. He gets tossed in and when the king shows up, he displays confidence and praise. That's what our attitude ought to be like. Confidence and praise. Not fear and hope, but confidence Confident in the fact that my God can deliver me if he so chooses. He may not. He can deliver me and praise that whatever he does is tremendous. Whatever God does is good. Don't miss that, Christian. Whatever God does is good. But pastor, I don't think it's good. The diagnosis doesn't seem to be good. But God is good. And up until this point, it didn't seem to be good. It didn't look to be good. It looked bad. 
Sometimes we throw in the towel back there. When God says, hang on, when I show up with the unexpected, it will be good. They say this, church family, there's sometimes that God waits to show up until after we're gone. Sometimes he waits to show up until after, after we're gone. Sometimes God says, what's going to be good is for you to come home. Or for this person to come home. This is going to be good. That's when it gets tough. Say, God, you're still good. You can still defeat the lions. God, I can still operate not in hope and fear, but God, I want to operate in confidence and praise because of who you are, what you have done, and what I know you will do. David, I'm sorry, David, Daniel had confidence in his personal God. He said to the king, O king, live forever, my God. My God. He's my God. I'm glad, I'm glad he's your God, but I'm really glad he's my God. There are some things I pray for that I don't tell anybody else, not my wife, not the church family, not my friends, because I want to know that God, my God, hears me. When he answers, I want to know that my prayers go to the throne of grace to my God. I'm glad he answers your prayer. That's a blessing. But I want to know that God answers my prayers. Because my heart is encouraged when my God hears me. And Christian, if you've never seen God answer one of your prayers, then put him to the test. He wants to glorify himself. He wants to show himself. He'll answer you. I promise you. I promise you he will. How can I promise you that? Because he promises. It's not my promise. It's his promise. When you find out that that God is your God, oh man, that's life changing. Daniel says, my God is personal God with personal safety. My God sent his angel, just one of them, didn't take a lot of them. He didn't send 10,000 angels, didn't need to, just sent one. What are just a few lions with one angel? And my, my God has a whole slew of them at his disposal if he so needs them. Other times he sent, he sent angels around people. But one time was a prophet, he sent angels all around on the hilltops. He can send multiple angels if he wants to, if he, so, if he thinks it's necessary. This time he just sent one. There's personal safety, but there's a personal walk. Daniel says, he shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him and God innocency was found in me. There was a clear conscience before God. Daniel, I don't believe that Daniel has pride in this statement. Daniel's not saying, I don't believe, hey, look at me. Look how good a guy I am. He's just being honest. He said, King, listen, before God, I have walked as I know how to walk. I can't do anything else. I've walked in innocency. He's not saying, I'm so perfect, that's why God helped me out. He's just saying, I've done everything I'm supposed to do that I know how to. And God honored that. God shows up and we have a clear conscience before Him. Listen here, some of you may need to get along with God. Say, God, purge me. God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, holding, fat, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. You see, God's bigger than any problem we have. There's a day after the earthquake of San Francisco. The day after the earthquake, a newsboy was showing a dazed newspaper man his way around the city. As they walked by, the young boy, the young newsboy philosophized. And he said this, you know, it took a long time for people to put this stuff up, but God, God done knock it down over in a minute. Then he finished with this saying, mister, taint no use for a fellow to think he can lick God. It's pretty good, that's pretty good theology right there. Ain't no use for someone to think they can lick God. Servant of God displays confidence and praise. The pagan king, hope and fear. Which one do you display right now? Problem may be huge, but God's bigger. And I see the final act. The final act, the bad guys lose. The good guy gets a promotion. So Daniel prospered. Verse 28. If you ever took some time to look back in chapter 1, 2, 3, and 5, and 6, you'll see that it seems like every, every other uh, chapter, every chapter, Daniel's prospering. Just like a side note, Daniel went through this, and by the way, he got promoted. 
Daniel went through this. By the way, he got he prospered. By the way, Daniel has now got this. He's got these robes and these jewels and these gold, and now he's this king. We want the promotion. We want the prosperity. But we don't want the hardship that Daniel faced. Don't ever forget where Daniel started was being taken captive away from his family and his country to a strange new land. Daniel honored God. Bad guys lose, a good guy gets a promotion. The king worships God. This pagan king makes a decree. He doesn't say this, but I wonder if it's kind of like a decree. Remember how the, how the bad guys of presidents and princes ordered the king and tricked him into making one with a, in the, according to the law of the Medes and Persians? Remember that beginning of the story? Made it unchangeable? I wonder, I just wonder, this is my own thoughts, I wonder if the king at this point made this along the same lines of the Medes and the Persians. I could see him doing that. He cast them and their families into the, into the lion's den. I could see him just saying, you know what? That's it. I'm done with you boys. I'm done with this. And he makes this decree. He talks about a living God to fear and tremble. He talks about the power, how he delivers and rescues. And that his kingdom shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall, not, shall be even unto the end. What a wonderful conversion. Because of one man's testimony. Because of one man's testimony and faithfulness, a whole nation, can we say almost globally, knew about this God. Amen. Daniel was cast into the lion's den and preserved, but because of this, almost everyone in the world, if not everyone, heard about the God of the universe. What is God doing? Magnifying himself. Daniel had to go here so everyone could hear about him. So before you start whining too much, God may just have something for you that's bigger than you. You may be just a little bit bigger part of the puzzle than you think. Daniel, I don't think, knew that by being a lion's den, now the whole world, the whole nations, the nations would hear about God of the universe. And if he had known, the little I know about Daniel, he would have jumped in there a day earlier. What I know about Daniel, if you had said to Daniel, what I know about Daniel, Daniel, if you jump in the lion's den, the whole world will know about Jehovah. What do you think Daniel would have done? He would have jumped in as quick as he could have. That's all it takes? Why didn't you lead off with that next time? You know, we could save all the time and be going back and praying, and you dragging me over there. Just tell me where to go, and I'll go. Listen, friend, as a Christian, as a child of God, God may have something huge planned. Wait for it. Wait for it. Let me give you some final assessments, just three thoughts will be done this morning. First thought is this. God is not bound by the natural, and He loves to work in the supernatural. What can God do in your life? The better question is, what can't He do in your life? Now I'll tell you what He can't do, what you don't let Him. We can bind God by our lack of faith. By our walk, we can bind the God of the universe. What can God not do? There's nothing He can't do. There's no solution He can't bring. It may mean jumping in the lion's den first. No lion's den, no supernatural. You see, we often want the answer before the problem. We want the bank account to be flush before the car breaks down. God, bring me the answer, and then bring me the problem, and I'll be okay. Or, we want to avoid the problem altogether. We don't want the lion's den, all right? That's inconvenient to our life. But God can't work in the supernatural if there's no problems in our lives. If everything is just wonderful. That's one of the major problems I have with that other gospel where, hey, it's going to be wonderful as you follow God, and it is wonderful as I follow God. But that doesn't mean that no problems will come. That just means God gets to use me in a special way, gets to use you in a special way. It may be at your job right now. You say, God, I don't know what you're doing. And he's like, you bet you don't. Just hold on, because when I finish working, you're going to be blown away. Amen. Just hold on. You see, God can work in the natural, but he loves to work in the supernatural. Oh, you can't walk? No problem. You can't see? No problem. Oh, you're dead? No problem. God can work in the natural, but he loves to work in the supernatural. See, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for God to show up whenever He wants to. 
on a Sunday afternoon. A pastor and his wife were walking, taking a Sunday afternoon stroll. They happened to walk past, uh, or during, during their walk there was a storm, so they took shelter in a little church. During the church they found like an afternoon class going on where the, where the man in charge there, the pastor apparently, was teaching catechisms to the young people there in the afternoon. As he was teaching the catechisms, he asked a question, what is a miracle? And a little girl put her hand up. It wasn't quite right, and so he asked for some more answers. And eventually he got, the, he got the answer that he wanted, which was a parable in action, and he seemed satisfied. But the answer the little girl first gave to this pastor and his wife that they overheard stuck with him. A parable in action is a good definition for a miracle, but her answer was this. Something we can't do, but Jesus can. God wants to work in in a way that we can't, but He can. See, God's not bound by the natural, but He loves to work in the supernatural. I'll give you the second thought this morning. Make sure you trust God more than you fear the lions. Trust God more than you fear the lions. See, one New Year's Day, it was a tournament of roses parade. A beautiful float suddenly sputtered and ran out of gas. The whole parade, the whole tournament of roses parade was held up until they got more gas for this particular float. The amusing part of the story is that the float was the float for the Standard Oil Company. At that time, probably the largest gas company in the world. And with its vast oil resources, it still couldn't get gas in its own float. Christians, we're part of the most powerful gas company in the world. Make sure you don't run out of gas. Trust God more than you feel the lions. Don't be stuck out there, barren, unfruitful, all right, apathetic in your walk because you're not trusting Him. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. One day a boy in Africa was sent on a lonely track through a country full of lions. Andrew was frightened, but he kept saying to himself, Heavenly Father, you set me on this journey. You'll look after me. Suddenly, as the story goes, he turned a corner and there in front of him were two huge, tawny lions crouching on an anthill, looking, and waiting for someone to walk or something to walk by. The story goes, he thought in his mind, what should he do? If he ran away, they'd surely come bounding after him, and if he went forward, they would surely spring on him. And so what did poor Andrew, trembling Andrew, this young boy do? The only thing a Christian ought to do, he knelt and he prayed right in the path. And he prayed his Heavenly Father would protect him. He said, well, I must forget my doubts and deliver this. So he got up and walked past the lions, and God did the same thing for this boy named Andrew that he did for Daniel. He shut the lion's mouth. They couldn't touch him because God was holding them back. Make sure you trust Him more than you fear them. And lastly, the last thought today, don't forget when God reveals Himself, the correct response is worship. This king had the correct response. You see, sometimes in our life, in your life, in my life, when God answers, we're quick to bless, but then we quickly move on in life. We quickly forget what God has done. We Maybe a day or two days. But our response is not worship this king. This pagan king made sure at the end that everyone knew where his loyalties lied. He passed a decree. Our temptation is to get back to normal, but our response ought to be to worship. When God works, make sure you worship. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and come. Let us exalt His name together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Our correct response is worship. Too often, our response is back to the normal. You got me through this one, Lord. Thank you. That was amazing. 
And I get up the next day, I live my life like nothing changed. The only response, the correct response that we ought to have when God works, worship Him. Amen. Our hearts will be strengthened. Our faith strengthened. We can say with confidence and praise, I believe God. And He is not just your God. He is my God. Ready for God to work? When He does, it's a great ending. Lord, I thank You for Your Word this morning. For Your wisdom that's from above. Lord, I don't know all the problems that are represented here this morning, whether online or in this auditorium. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be touched. My friend, as you're here today with your heads bowed and eyes closed or online, I wonder if God touched your heart this morning. I wonder if there's something you're going through. You've not responded the way you're supposed to respond. You've not been a Daniel. Friend, God wants to do something. What if you're here today and you say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me? Just one when you pray. That I'll respond the right way to God. I needed that this morning. And as you spoke, God spoke to me. Just slip your hand up for me and say, that's me. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning or listening online, joining us online, and you don't know that you're on your way to heaven. You can say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you let me pray for you as well? Would you mind slipping your hand up like the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to them. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. So slip it up, slip it back down. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You know, if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ. The Bible says we're all sinners, but that Christ died for us. And that by believing, believing on Him and Him alone, we can have eternal life. My friend, you can trust Christ today right where you're at, whether you're here in the auditorium sitting down or whether you're at home. You can pray this simple prayer, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. And if you're this morning, you're listening to me online, and you've never trusted Christ, I would encourage you to trust Him today. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell Him, He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that He was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and Him alone. In just a moment, we're going to stand and pray with our heads bowed and eyes closed. The Lord, touch your heart. I encourage you to come forward and seal that decision before the Lord. If you trusted Christ just now, would you let us know? There'll be people at the front. You can come up and say, I, I trusted Christ. If you're online, there'll be a phone number or website. Send us a message. Lord, bless this time of invitation. May we respond to you in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, stand to our feet. The instruments are already playing. If you need to do business with God, the altar's open.